Hello, welcome to a talk about CAPE, an asymmetric PAKE protocol from key hiding authenticated key exchange. It's uh, a joint work with Yankee Gu and Hugo Kraftcheck. I'll start by recalling what PAKE is. PAKE is the protocol where two parties contribute passwords. And if those passwords are the same, uh, then uh, the two parties compute the same random session key. Otherwise, they get independent keys. And this implies uh, authentication because if the two passwords differ, the key uh, leaks, one party computes, leaks nothing about the, 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 uh, the key of the other party. What are the most efficient uh, existing PAKE constructions? Uh, very briefly, assuming standard groups and random oracle model, the most efficient schemes use the password to blind in a way uh, messages of the dv Hellman key exchange protocol. And uh, each of these uh, protocol uh, proposal could be viewed in this way, starting from the encrypted key exchange of uh, EKE of Belov and Merit. And uh, the overhead, these, some of these protocols uh, create, in particular this one, are, are very low compared to the underlying the Hellman key exchange. In a client-server setting, it's useful to have an asymmetric version of PAKE called APAKE, uh, where the server stores a hashed password, uh, not the password itself, and uh, the protocol checks that the client's password hashes into the server-held value. Uh, the advantage of this is that on server compromise, Adversary doesn't leak, doesn't get the password itself, but it's hash. So if it wants to compute the password, this is a one-way function, but it's a deterministic one. So it can compute forward on any password guess. However, it's called brute force search. But if the entropy of this password is high enough, then uh, the search will, uh, then the password will escape uh, the search, right? The search will fa fa fail to find the password. Existing uh, APIC constructions um, are formed by uh, essentially a PAKE uh, with uh, something added. And this is either a password-based encryption or a signature. And the signature is the lower cost option. Uh, using Schnorr signature, it costs half the key exchange. So the overall cost of such solution is about one and a half of uh, the P. Hellman. It can be strengthened to strong asymmetric peg where the hash is randomized. Uh, the uh, point is that uh, because it's a randomized uh, hash now, it cannot be pre-computed, right? Because before server compromise, adversary doesn't know this randomization. And the most efficient uh, strong APEG uh, is the opaque construction, uh, which is a compiler from oblivious so the random function and authenticated key exchange. Uh, for this, I will invite you to, to these uh, talks or papers. Uh, but for uh, authenticated key exchange, we'll talk in a second. Uh, the bottom line is that both of these can be instantiated in this setting at the cost of key exchange each. So this gives you two key exchange uh, costs for this strong uh, asymmetric peg. Now, what about this building block? We will need it in this uh, in this work. Uh, authenticated key exchange refers to authentication key exchange in a public key setting. So each party has secret and public key pair. Uh, the public keys are assumed universally known and tied to identities of these uh, of these parties. And the functionality is that if uh, you, you get the same key, even only if you supply the assumed public, uh, secret key corresponding to the assumed public key, and so does your counterparty. Uh, there are many uh, protocol proposals. You know, TLS uh, realizes this, uh, this type of uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, and uh, the most efficient is HMQV. And um, somewhat surprisingly, it actually gets the same cost as the dp Hellman key exchange. Uh, we'll look at this protocol in a few slides because we will we'll use it here. Um, so uh, summing up, the efficiency landscape is that authenticated key exchange, as well as symmetric uh, password key exchange, 
can both be implemented at the cost which is which matches plain unauthenticated Diffie-Hellman here exchange. Excuse me. Now, this is not so for asymmetric peg and even less for strong asymmetric peg. So, what do we do here? Uh, our main contribution is a protocol we call CAPE. It stands for Key Hiding Authenticated Password Key Exchange, and it's an asymmetric peg uh, created using a key hiding authenticated key exchange. And because the overhead of this construction over the underlying uh, key hiding egg is very low, and uh, HMQV turns out to be a key hiding egg. So basically the APEC has the same efficiency as HMQV, and that in particular places APEC in the same, uh, now APEC cost as, as asymmetric peg costs essentially the same as the symmetric one. In more detail, our APEC construction is a black box compiler from key hiding egg and ideal cipher. Now this ideal cipher has to work on groups. So if the group is an elliptic curve, um, you have to work a little bit to implement it. Uh, one possible way to implement it would be using uh, uniform encodings of elliptic curve points, like alligator two or alligator square. Another uh, is, uh, uh, comes from the recent uh, work by McCoy, uh, uh, Rosluck and Roy, uh, which show uh, something which you can call weak ideal cipher that can be implemented with a single, for a group, implementable using a single random oracle hash onto the group per each cipher operation. And um, they showed that this is sufficient for encrypted key exchange which originally used the ideal cipher, right? Uh, we believe that it can be also plugged in here, but still have to formally confirm that. Um, so because we base our construction on this new key hiding authenticated key exchange uh, uh, sub protocol, we uh, give, uh, define this notion in a composable way. So in particular, we can plug it in our own construction. And we showed that in random Morocco model, it's, implement, it's uh, realized by several implicitly authenticated key exchange protocols out there, including HMQB, Triple DH, and Scheme. The last one is interesting uh, because it's a black box construction from CAM. So it can lead to post quantum APEC uh, design alternative to those. Um, now, uh, taking the two together gives us uh, uh, the most efficient APEC. Uh, to date, and it's optimal in terms of computational cost because uh, it has uh, roughly the same cost as the underlying GPM and key exchange. Uh, it comes at the price, though, it has four flows, uh, three if the server starts, uh, versus uh, three flows in the standard setting where the client in, is an initiator, uh, uh, which, which was the case for prior uh, Apex. Uh, now, an interesting uh, implication, another interesting implication is that if you uh, instantiate, use this uh, now low-cost APEC, you can use it to instantiate an alternative strong APEC construction called OPEC prime, which was given in the same paper that introduced OPEC. Uh, and the, because now APEC and AIC cost the same, so these two constructions are excuse me, have the same computational efficiency, uh, but the new construction has a funny advantage. Uh, namely, it offers a graceful security degradation from strong APEC to just APEC if this sub-protocol breaks. Now, in what sense can it break? Uh, it's a key leak. It's information theoretic for the client, so, um, this uh, means that the, this implies this um, uh, graceful security degradation. Why is it useful? For example, if you outsource the oblivious PRF block, uh, but this outsourcing fails you, uh, the worst that, that happens is that you downgrade from this to here. Uh, another is that uh, perhaps everything is quantum secure, but uh, OPRF not so. 
um, and and indeed the uh, quantum uh, secure OPRF is um, uh, still not uh, not very efficient. Uh, so the, the, it comes at the price. Uh, first of all, uh, also we have one more protocol flow. So this is a four message protocol, whereas opaque is three. And it needs a specific egg, uh, namely key hiding eggs. And in particular, it cannot use the sigma uh, egg from TLS, which will probably make integration with TLS uh, easier for opaque compared to opaque prime. Okay. So that's the that's the contributions. Uh, in the rest of the talk, I'll talk about uh, what's this key hiding A case, and then uh, once uh, we get that clear, uh, how that this compiler works. Okay, so here is the key hiding A. So uh, it's in the public key setting, where uh, but uh, everybody has a secret public key pair. But unlike the standard A notion. Uh, we modeled input things the private public key of the presumed counterparty as the explicit private input of each uh, of each party participating in the protocol. So these are not uh, defined by names. Uh, these are uh, explicit inputs. And um, uh, the rest uh, looks the same. And now, where is the key hiding property? So notice that the key, uh, the only output that this party gets, assume client is an attacker, is uh, just a random key, right? Which is whether it's independent of K prime or the same, uh, this person doesn't even know. So in particular, basically everything about these inputs is hidden by the, must be hidden by the protocol messages which will realize this notion. Um, however, uh, of course, the server computes the key here and it can uh, use it. So without loss of generality, it gives it to the environment, which gives it to the client, right? So the client basically can reveal what the session key server computes is. And now using it, it can test whether its uh, secret key, public key input, match uh, the one server uses. So in that sense, if it's, uh, that, uh, that's the, that's the way in which it's not key hiding. So if you have the corresponding matching pair, you will test and figure out that I use the ones that match yours. But if you don't have them, then uh, in particular, you don't have the secret key corresponding to this one. You learn nothing about either of these two inputs. Okay. Uh, however, we have no perfect forward secrecy. Okay, so in particular, when uh, the server, let's say the client, uh, at the time when it, when the client uh, runs this protocol, uh, it really doesn't have to have these inputs. So it is uh, possible that after the protocol stops, uh, it uh, really then uses the inputs and computes this key, and then compares to the key that the server gets, and it, which obviously learned from the environment which allows basically offline testing of any SKC PKS pair that addressee learns in the future. Now, for perfect for secrecy, this is easy to stop. You just introduce key confirmation message. So the client has to confirm that it learned the key that matches the server one, or otherwise the server is not going to output this one, which proves that the client knows these inputs before this guy uh, decides to use the key, right? So it, it just stops this whole thing. However, petal forward privacy is not so easy because the first party, let's say it's the client who leaks, uh, basically sends their key confirmation message, allows the server side attacker to then, well, he cannot, if he doesn't have these matching inputs, then he cannot compute the key and he cannot send his uh, key confirmation. So the client will abort. However, after, if he learns these inputs, he can still compute the key and test whether it was equal because it has the key confirmation message from the client. Now, one can implement more secure, uh, more secure notion. I mean, basically a notion which has a perfect forward privacy using the standard secure computation approaches, commit to input, uh, uh, in particular commit to these inputs at the protocol execution. Um, 
we don't because we are not interested in the strongest properties to, you can get for this. What we're interested in is to model minimal properties necessary uh, that this compiler goes through. And also that the properties will actually be realized by these all least expensive uh, key agreement protocols because it's the efficiency of the resulting uh, asymmetric peg that we're after. Okay. Uh, so here is one example of how to realize this. this is a triple DP Hellman used in the signal uh, application. Uh, uh, the setting is like the keys are like in Ergamal encryption or the Hellman key exchange, and the messages that people send are just uh, the Hellman key exchange again. Note that the messages are independent of the inputs, so the messages themselves reveal nothing about these inputs. Uh, now, how is the key computed? It's computed using a three, as an arrow hash of three separate Diffie-Hellman instances, where the client always makes one uh, contribution and the server makes another, either the ephemeral key for the client or the long-term key, and likewise either ephemeral key for the server or a long-term key. And uh, um, Okay, so the protocol messages, but note that the protocol messages do not not reveal anything about the long-term input, but they do not commit to long-term inputs, right? So this party might not know these inputs when they send a message and when uh, the counterparty outputs this key. But if they learn these inputs afterwards, they can complete this equation and learn the key as well. HMQV can be seen as an optimization of triple DV Hellman. Everything is the same. Uh, except for the key derivation equation, which uh, in a very nice way uh, combines this uh, three, three way or really four way matching of ephemeral keys and uh, permanent keys for, for each uh, side. Because the Diffie Hellman contribution on the client side is a linear combination of the ephemeral Diffie Hellman contribution and the long term. And so it is for the server, where the linear equation here is a random one. Uh, with the uh, random coefficient output by the random oracle hash. So we showed that this protocol has the same properties as triple db Hellman, in particular it's key hiding, uh, but it is advantageous in that its cost is uh, very, it's all roughly the same as the db Hellman key exchange itself. Okay, so now how do we get this compiler using the key hiding uh, egg and an IDR cipher to get asymmetric peg? Because it's an asymmetric peg, we have to specify what is this quote-unquote hash password that the server stores for a given client. Okay, so here is how we compute. We pick two uh, public key pairs, one for the client, one for the server, and then we encrypt the AKE inputs of the client, namely the secret key of the client and the public key of the server. We together encrypt that under the client's password, and we call this an envelope. The server's file is that envelope and the credentials it, use, it needs for authenticated key exchange. So its own secret key, the secret key here, and the public key for the client. Now, uh, note, public key in uh, these uh, crypto systems is a um, group element. Hence, we need ideal cipher on, on groups. Now, how the protocol goes, very simple. Uh, the server sends this envelope to the client. The client uses her password to decrypt the envelope and interpret the outputs as the secret key for herself and the public key for the server. And then the two run uh, key hiding egg on these corresponding inputs. Uh, now, crucially, you need a round of key confirmations. Excuse me. And importantly, uh, the client has to go first. And uh, these are important for security, as we'll uh, shortly explain, but also uh, they account for this extra uh, protocol round compared to uh, alternative APEC designs. It's interesting to compare this compiler to the classic encrypted key exchange of uh, Belov and Merit. Both protocols use IDR cipher uh, to encrypt uh, group elements and compile some form of key exchange into PEG, but EKE compiles plain key exchange into a symmetric peg, and we compile authenticated key exchange into asymmetric peg. 
and how we do? Well, encrypted key exchange uses the idea cipher to password encrypt every message of the key exchange. What we do is to ideal cipher encrypt under the password only the inputs of the client in the authenticated key exchange. Okay, so some similarities and, and some uh, differences, but it's funny that this very classic protocol kind of gets resurfaced in, um, in, a, in a different uh, version here. Um, so uh, now wh why is it secure? So uh, let's uh, notice that uh, basically by the property of this, the only thing that the party engaging here learns is a key and it's a random key regardless of the input. So the real information is in the envelope and in these key confirmation messages. So let's look at the envelope first. Uh, for a passive attacker, uh, they can decrypt an envelope uh, uh, under arbitrary passwords, and every time they do so, it gives them some random secret key for the client and random pass public key for the server. Uh, however, by the key hiding properties of egg, this pair cannot be correlated with the inputs of the honest parties unless through an active attack. So uh, let's look at an active attack. Uh, first, if the attacker plays the server role, so imagine an attacker on this side, what do they do? First, they have a choice of the envelope. Uh, however, because it's an ideal cipher, every choice of a cipher text commits to a single key, which is a password in this case, uh, for which the decryption is non-random, so it can be controlled by the attacker. Uh, so in other words, attacker can encrypt any secret key for the client and public key for the server that they want on a single password. But on any other password, it would decrypt into random keys. In particular, if it does, uh, the, because this key will be random, so the adversary cannot know the corresponding secret key and therefore cannot go through this protocol and authenticate and basically cannot make anything from this message and cannot send that one. Uh, uh, on, on, uh, um, on the other hand, for the password, uh, for the single password, adversary does control what these inputs are and therefore can pick them in such a way that it knows the corresponding uh, values on the other side and go through the protocol, right? But that's a single password. It's an online choice. So this is the same as, uh, as, as a pick but that does allow you every session you interact with, you can test one password on it. Now, what about client's confirmation message? It is necessary uh, because uh, uh, the adversary playing the client without this message could later, given the client's, the server's key, test, uh, perform this, this test offline. It can uh, decrypt uh, the envelope under different passwords and get these uh, candidates, and for each of them completes this and test against the, uh, the server's output, right? But if it has the key confirmation message, if it has to send it, then that has to commit to a single value here, which means a single value here, which means a single password. And again, that is a online choice of a unique password on which the adversary plays here. Uh, the server's key confirmation uh, is, is a little more subtle. Uh, it basically protects uh, against uh, Without it, the protocol would be insecure uh, against future, the past client sessions, which use the key here without waiting for the key confirmation, would be insecure against future compromises of the server, where the adversary learns these values and completes this, confirms here, and now knows the key for all prior sessions. Okay, so, but with the key confirmation, this is stopped. And with that, I conclude. Uh, we uh, showed a new APEC construction uh, with optimal efficiency. Uh, in the process, we defined key hiding aches and showed that some protocols realize it efficiently. And it has these interesting uh, implications for also for strong uh, asymmetric APEC. Some follow up questions. Uh, what about optimal cost and optimal uh, round complexity? and uh, about uh, lattice-based uh, implications of this. And with that, I uh, conclude and thank everyone listening and invite you to uh, the